Hello and thank you for joining us for this World Council of Credit Unions virtual event, an overview of EU policy on digital finance and digital assets. My name is Greg Newman, Director of Communications for World Council. World Council International Advocacy is hosting this virtual event to examine developments in the European Union on new regulations surrounding digital finance, including crypto assets, cybersecurity, payments, open banking, and more. With the European Union leading the way on digital finance, these regulations could have implications for regulatory approaches in other parts of the world as well. And today you'll hear from Andrew Price, Senior Vice President of International Advocacy for WOKU, Nicholas Reinhardt, co-founder and director of Afor Consulting, and Andrea Jones Rodriguez, a junior consultant at Afor Consulting. If any questions come into your mind as you listen to today's webinar, please feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and type them in there. We'll be asking questions of today's panelists as time allows. Also, this presentation is being recorded. It's also going to be available later today on the World Council YouTube channel. I'm pleased now to welcome in WOKU Senior Vice President of International Advocacy, Andrew Price. Andrew, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you and good morning and or, or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Welcome welcome to our conference today on digital assets. I'm, I'm really happy to be bringing this to you. There's so much uh, going on with respect to uh, digitalization and the evolution of, of, of the, the regulation of uh, everything digital from payments to open banking uh, uh, to cryptocurrencies and, and, and everything else. And it's evolving very quickly. Just so you know, I mean, here at World Council, we, we advocate on behalf of credit unions, uh, not, not only at the national level, but also with the international standards. And, and a lot of work is being um, done in that area. But, but today, what I want to do is, is focus on a lot of the, the new regulations that are, that are coming out of the EU uh, that are, I, I think, going to be transformative and, and informative to you, where are you wherever you are in the, in the rest of the world. Uh, as you know, the European Union tends to lead the way on a lot of the issues. A lot of the international standard setters are, are housed there. FATF is in, in Paris, the European Banking Authority in Paris. Ba Basel is in Switzerland. The IASB is there in London. And, and so the EU tend, tends to kind of uh, get ahead of a lot of the issues. Uh, and not only do you have a body that regulates uh, you know, a, lot of, a lot of countries in the area as well, if you think the EU GDPR, that kind of spread like wildfire uh, uh, around the world, and a lot of pieces of that and approaches are being uh, uh, adopted around the world. And, and so I'm, I'm really excited to, to bring with you a presentation by our, our consultants from before here, Nicholas and Andrea, you're going to hear with. Uh, they're, they're fantastic and have been involved in, in uh, a lot of these issues that are coming down. And so there's a lot of ground to cover um, today. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to um, uh, Nicholas to start off with the presentation. And just uh, we, we've we've left time for questions at the end because we're going to cover a lot, and I know it's going to generate a lot of questions. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Nick. Thank you very much indeed to you, Andy, and to Craig for the very warm introduction, and thanks for the opportunity for me and Andrea to present this today. As you say. There's a lot going on and we have to see how we kind of go through it. There's a lot of material here, but we will try and focus on things that are of particular relevance to, to VOKU. What we want to talk about is a little bit about what's happening in Europe on crypto assets. We call it Mika, the markets in uh, crypto assets uh, regulation. It's basically, as you say, one of the first, Japan is doing something similar, but it's really one of the first global regulatory approaches to crypto assets in a comprehensive way. There are also other regulatory initiatives impacting the crypto asset space, notably around anti-money laundering, but some other issues, uh, and we come to that. Um, we then want to focus, and that's the second big block of this presentation, is talk a little bit about what's happening on digital payments, because uh, again, Europe is trying to create a, a framework within a single market, bring together 27 member states in an integrated way in retail payments. And then if we've got time, we want to briefly touch on operational resilience and artificial intelligence. Uh, the good news here is that we work very closely with Andy and the team on operational resilience and work very hard in keeping uh, credit unions out of the European framework. There's still individual member states frameworks that you might be subject to, but therefore we can make that quite short. With that, thank you. Focus so maybe on uh, crypto assets uh, first, on Mika. 
And if we look at this, um, it's basically a piece of legislation that, that tries to comprehensively deal with crypto assets by looking at it in a both horizontal and a vertical way. What does that mean? The legislation aims to regulate anyone offering crypto assets, so at the point of issuance, and what are the requirements at the point of issuance, and who can issue crypto assets and for what purpose. And the second part is what we call regulation of service providers. So, so once a crypto asset is in circulation, you know, whether it's an exchange, a depository, an advisory service, an investment service, a payment service, all these service providers around the crypto space also need to be regulated. So it's a full regulation of the entire ecosystem. But it's important to recognize that MIC consists of two parts. And this, I, I particularly like this slide because I think it's the most colorful one we have on the deck. But, but basically, it's important to recognize what, what Europe does or doesn't do. <laughs> because Europe doesn't solve the famous conundrum that we had in the US as to when is a crypto, crypto asset actually a crypto asset? How do we define crypto assets? Because ultimately, we have the same distinction in Europe that you have under case law in the US, for example which states that if it is a security, as in the sense that we know of, if it behaves like a security, if it's a tokenized form of a security, or just make life more complicated, if it is a commodity, a recognized commodity, then it falls under existing securities law. So that's kind of the pinkish kind of fly lucky box left of the green box. If it's financial instrument, it, it's uh, treated like financial, financial instrument. And then you've got certain crypto assets which are not covered by Mika otherwise. And those are the, the ones that are either issued by central banks because under European law, the central bank is a, a world of its own and doesn't fall under regulation or European regulation. Or it is a crypto asset that is not being used by the financial services industry. So if Andy and I make up a new crypto asset, that doesn't automatically bring us into Mika. And that leaves us in the space in the middle, the green space, where, as I pointed out, part one of Mika is the regulation of the offerer of crypto assets. And the crypto assets in Europe just make life more complicated, are broken down into three categories based on their underlying nature. What is any digital asset that is unbacked, unbacked by any form. So Bitcoin today, Ethereum would fall into that category. And then we have a second category which gained a lot of attention in the discussion, but really hasn't materialized yet, triggered by Libra and Diem, so the, the then announcements by Facebook of an asset backed crypto asset. And that could be either uh, backed by any type of assets, a basket of assets. That's what the old Libra model was. Or it is backed by just one currency. So it's a euro backed or US dollar backed or yen backed uh, crypto asset. And then it's an e-money token. So just important to understand that you've got that subset. Even though today, most crypto assets are unbacked. And depending on what type of an underlying asset it is, the obligations on the offerer will change. But in principle, what all of these have in common is they have to issue a white paper, they have to be subject to, to a licensing regime, they have to have certain disclosure requirements in place, they have to have conflict of interest in place, uh, asset segregation, various other things. It's quite onerous. If on top of that, they're asset backed, they're effectively a stable coin, then there's also obligations on the stabilization mechanism. How do you make sure that the underlying crypto asset maintains its value? As I say, for now, this is primarily an academic discussion, but we have to see how the crypto market evolves. And obviously the purpose of this legislation is to create an ecosystem or, or regulatory framework that covers the entire ecosystem. The last point on the slide that's worth mentioning is just at the bottom, is that certain aspects are currently under discussion as to how they're going to be treated. And one of them is what we call um, NFTs. Um, they're, they're basically non-fungible tokens. It's a new type of 
crypto asset or a subset of crypto asset, which I'm happy to answer more questions on. And the other one is what we call DIFI, decentralized finance. So this is about who's involved in the, in the process. It's basically pure blockchain distributed crypto assets. Uh, if we then go further and go beyond this visual demonstration, just, just the point, uh, an added complication at the European level, just to explain the whole framework, is that for stable coins, the EU also differentiates between ex you know, certain types of stable coins and significant stable coins. And what do they mean by significant? It's basically, this was the direct response to Facebook. Um, it's kind of the anticipation that this is a stable coin that effectively could challenge money the circulation of money because of its size, acceptance, uh, and, and just availability. And for those type of significant stable coins, additional regulatory requirements are being put in place. In essence, if I wanted to be a bit cynical, such burdensome requirements that it becomes virtually economically unfeasible to run them because there's this concern of not uh, undermining uh, monetary sovereignty of, of the EU. But in theory, it's possible. And the thresholds for significance are not that high. It's actually 2 million users. I sometimes say you have more people on the London tube in a day than, than that. So kind of some of the thresholds are quite potentially quite easily to reach. You see others around capitalization and, and volume of transaction. So, so there's a certain concept of, of global acceptance of these uh, stable coins, but the requirements are additional regulatory capital, even more requirements on, on the stabilization mechanism. And most importantly, and uh, maybe the biggest burden is a legal redemption right. So if you hold this stable coin, you want to convert it back into dollars or euros, ultimately the offerer has to convert it back for you. So you've got that uh, automatic redemption. And the reason why I'm saying this is so expensive is because if you have to run a stabilization mechanism, that costs you a few percent. If you then have 3% regulatory capital, if you then have management costs attached to the running of a stable coin, you easily come to 5, 7, 8% operational costs. While in comparison, a digital euro or a digital dollar runs at zero cost because it's issued by the central bank. So you see kind of the burden potentially imposed on these stable coins. And it is not the only, but it's certainly one of the reasons why we have not seen a DM emerge in Europe at the moment. The second part of uh, Mika, which we pointed to, looks at the service providers. So if we look at the service providers, again, I can go into much more detail, but I think this uh, is opening up the questions, but this is more about the design of the legislation. It requires a licensing framework, as I said, for the, for the offerer, I talked about that just now, but now for the individual companies active in the ecosystem. And in the ecosystem, the legislation identifies a number of services, you see them here, it's seven services, if I count correctly, uh, which are the custodian services, so somebody's ultimately responsible for, for holding stablecoin, making sure that there's no cyber uh, break-in, so to speak, uh, that it's accurately documented that you are the owner of a particular stablecoin. The exchanges, obviously the most important parties in, in, in the activity. And then there's a number of other type of security related services like execution services where you use a broker or uh, placement that's kind of where you kind of uh, take basically market crypto assets. Also reception, transmission of services. So that's kind of intra financial institutions activities, but also advisory and payment services. <clears throat> and for any of these services that are provided for a crypto asset that is deemed to fall under Mika, that is basically issued or offered under Mika, any service provider that meets any of these seven services, provides any of these seven services, they require a separate license by a national competent authority. And they have to ultimately uh, fulfill all kinds of requirements again, from capital requirements, um, 
segregation services, conflict of interest services, marketing services, and so on and so forth. But they have one advantage in Europe, and that is kind of what makes the European single market. They benefit from a single passport. So once you get a license, be it in Lithuania, Malta, Germany, or, or wherever, you can kind of then provide that service into the entire EU market. The final thing I would want to say is that in Europe, ultimately, service providers are regulated at the national level. The one thing I forgot in the previous slide of significant offers, some of those are actually subject to oversight at the European level. Um, with that, maybe um, looking at some of the remaining open issues in the legislative file, because Mika is not yet completed. Um, very briefly, uh, we have hopefully the final negotiations on Thursday, so we can check whether any of what I'm saying is, is overrun by, by political discussions on Thursday evening. But ultimately, it is still a question of scope, as I said, whether non-fungible tokens and decentralized finance should be in scope and how. There is a call to maybe bring uh, significant service providers, uh, crypto asset service providers, CASPs, into a direct European supervisory framework. So if you're a particularly big exchange, like Bitcoin, Binance, whatever else names you want to mention, should they maybe directly be supervised at European level? Then there is still a question, while I said at the beginning that we have a distinction between securities regulation and crypto assets, there are similar overlays with existing payment regulation, other types of securities regulation, uh, e-money regulation, where, where the lines are a bit blurred. And we've done a lot of lobbying around that to clarify those lines. Some of them have been clarified. I'm afraid others will be subject to future revisions at the sectoral level, at the, for example, of individual payments legislation. Um, and then I think it, it's just useful to know that ultimately, you know, we have to see how it practically will work when supervisors decide whether a particular crypto asset is in scope or not, because just imagine Germany decides that crypto asset is actually security, but France decides that it isn't and should be on the Mika. What do we do in such a situation? You know, who, who moves first? So we will see some potentially differentiation of interpretation, which in the single market is never a great thing. And then Andrea will come in a moment to the anti-money laundering rules. And then, by the way, because in Europe, we love sustainable finance at the moment, um, uh, parliamentarians are spending a lot of time in clarifying actually what, crypto asset, what the impact of crypto assets is on energy consumption. So to what extent do crypto asset offers need to disclose the energy consumption related to the use of crypto assets. It's a bit of an esoteric debate, but it's keeping a lot of people in Europe busy at the moment. So that is, I think, the overall framework on crypto assets. We think that legislation will come into force and be fully operational from about 2025. Everything takes a bit of time in Europe. Uh, but with that, I pass over to my colleague Andrea, who will look in a little bit more detail at the anti-money laundering aspects. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Uh, well, taking on to what Nick was just uh, just referring to, indeed, uh, in terms of crypto, one of the areas where we see a lot of action is exactly on how to prevent the use of crypto assets um, for money laundering and terrorism financing purposes. So here on this slide, I will focus mostly on what the Europe is doing, but it's important to, to recognize that a lot of the European actions are also trying to align to the international discussions. And of course, here, uh, I highlight the relevance of the Financial Action Tax Force, notably in terms of their travel. But, uh, but well, taking a step for, for Europe, we will focus primarily on three files where we see most actions lately. The first one is the transfer of funds regulation, which uh, we also re uh, refer to as the wire transfer regulation. And in fact, this is already an existing piece of regulation, which was reopened last summer by the European Commission in order to extend the scope and to extend the obligations that already apply to tra traditional payment transactions and to extend these obligations as well to crypto assets. So essentially what it does is to extend the scope of the existing regulation to crypto asset service providers, both uh, the CASP of the sender and of the beneficiary and subject them to the same 
information requirements uh, that we would expect in a traditional payment transactions, but uh, for transactions in crypto assets. So this includes information on the name, the addresses, uh, so on and so forward. An important distinction that I would like to highlight here, and in fact, it's different from both the FATF standards, but also the EU rules for traditional payment and conventional payment transactions, is that during the co-legislative process, so both the European Parliament and the, European, and the Council of the European Union, they deleted the threshold, uh, which was a threshold of a thousand euros, below which uh, transfers of crypto assets would not require to be accompanied by this type of information. So this was deleted, meaning that effectively every transaction of crypto assets, regardless of their value, will be subject to, to these information requirements. Now, we would expect, still expect, this file to, to be agreed upon in the upcoming days by the both co-legislators, and therefore this, uh, this will remain uh, in the final text. Just a quick note as well to a second point that was introduced during the co-legislative process um, is regard, uh, regards unhosted wallets, wallets which have been uh, pushed very hard by the European Parliament to introduce uh, verification of information for unhosted wallets, and we would also expect this to remain um, in the text. If I can take a, a jump to the wider IML package, perhaps, so the last line we have here on the on the table. This was also proposed last summer, uh, and the main objective is to further harmonize the money laundering and the money laundering rules uh, in the European Union, and they do this through three different proposals which comprise the, the package. So the first one is in fact the first anti-money laundering uh, regulation that we have uh, at European level. Then we also have a proposal for a new anti-money laundering directive. This would be the six and will of course replace the current one. Uh, but there's also a proposal for, um, for creating a completely new anti-money laundering authority which would supervise uh, entities that will be deemed or under certain um, criteria will be deemed high risk and therefore require direct supervision at the European level by this new European authority. Now, uh, these three files are still being negotiated, including the file for the new anti-money laundering authority. So we do not know for certain which criteria uh, will be agreed upon to define whether or not um, an entity is considered high risk, but we can have an idea uh, based on size, on the nature, potentially on the cross-border nature of the activities if they go down that road. But um, but this is not certain. Uh, so potentially it's still too early to say, but there is the, uh, the possibility for certain crypto asset providers to be brought as obliged entities for direct supervision um, with this new anti-money laundering authority. Maybe just a small note, perhaps, to put some context into the AML package, uh, which follows, in fact, a number of scandals that have been observed in the last couple of years, uh, mainly in the banking sector. Therefore, while we still do not know the criteria, we would expect uh, that credit institutions would be um, mostly the, on the spotlight of AMLA and not necessarily uh, other type of entities. But as I mentioned, still early to say until the process of negotiation uh, is concluded, which we would expect to last until uh, last, uh, last autumn, uh, next autumn. So I would stop here in terms of the money laundering authority, but I would also like to shed some light on some key issues that are still opening regarding the AML package, uh, the wider AML package. The first one uh, is the overlap with the European Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR, because on one hand, while the package does push for further information exchanges, for example, not only between the entities, but with the FIUs, uh, with AMLA as well, um, we need to see to which extent can these new information exchanges and these enhanced information exchange take place under the general protection rules. Uh, and we still need further clarity on the on these and more on the practicalities. How will, for example, uh, know your customer requirements uh, work in practice for crypto? Uh, same thing for um, supranational reporting, for example. Um, then finally, on the uh, AML front, uh, we would also like to highlight, uh, which unfortunately unfortunately has become more relevant in the upcoming month, in the last couple of months, uh, is the sanctions regime. 
So, of course, here the idea is to avoid the use of crypto assets to circumvent economic sanctions. And at the moment, we do have already in place um, the rules to avoid the circumventions of the sanctions that are being applied uh, towards Russia, also Belarus. And they are doing so through an alignment with the wire transfer regulation, which I just referred to. However, like Nick also alluded to, and how, as I've been saying, we do not have a licensing regime in place, for example, um, the wire transfer is not yet in place. So in fact, we do not have uh, a systemic and comprehensive way to actually track uh, the enforce and enforce these current rules. So how, it, how much are they actually being enforced is very hard to say uh, at the moment. I think in terms of money laundering, I'll stop here and would focus now on the broader payments, uh, digital payments discussion. So I would first like to, to take a step back to actually understand, uh, before going into more detail on the European actions, to take a step back and understand uh, where is the Commission, where is the European Union coming from when they put forward the legislative proposals? And we have identified, that there's, a, there's more, but we have identified two main pillar stones of these actions. The first one we have here is a strategic autonomy discussion. So strategic autonomy, it is a broader debate and it is focused on building Europe's own capabilities, not only on payments, but you can think about energy, for example. Um, but payments are considered strategic and the European Union wants to leverage on them uh, in order to build its own solutions, its own capabilities, and as I, I will mention a bit further on, uh, also to reduce the reliance that it has on non-European pl uh, players. So also a small note to mention that, uh, well, there's a whole uh, strategic autonomy discussion, but it also goes in parallel, right? Reinforcing the strategic role of payments also goes in parallel uh, with reinforcing the international role of the euro, uh, which is also an important objective for the current commission. Uh, the second pillar I would like to I would like to mention is to the, the efforts from the commission, from the union, in uh, reducing the current fragmentation in the EU payments markets. And here, uh, I believe it's important to never forget that ultimately the objective of the European Union uh, is to build a single market, and this includes a single market for payments, not only but only. Uh, but also for payments. Um, so also payments, uh, the payment sector is highly scalable, so it's in a great position to actually achieve these, uh, this single market. So all the actions that are taken by the European Union ultimately have this objective to reduce the fragmentation that currently exists in the rules uh, between the different member states in the Union. Um, I'll say that having these uh, these objectives in mind and understanding the strategic importance of uh, of payments for for Europe, we can then identify a number of drivers in the EU payments policy, um, which then motivate the legislative proposals that I will mention uh, in a couple of minutes. We have enumerated the, these these here, uh, but we will go the avoidance first and foremost of non-European digital players. So. Uh, Non-EU players are currently dominating the European markets in payments, and we're thinking, for example, of global uh, card schemes. Um, and again, reducing these, these reliance goes hand in hand with the broader objective of strategic autonomy, of increasing strategic autonomy uh, in the Union. A second driver that we can identify is the rollout of instant payments. Um, and here, instant payments are in a way seen as one of the best ways to actually uh, achieve the single market through ideally a truly pan-European solution and potentially connecting to one of our or to the third point, it would ideally be an account-based instant payment solution um, to, to reach the single market. The third point we have here is the intention to move away from cards and promote, as I mentioned, account-based payments. And this could be done through, for example, the instant payments, which is currently the, the objective. Um, the fourth and fifth uh, drivers that we have here on the screen, I will come back to them uh, in a moment, but is the rollout of the digital euro and create these open access to payments is very related to the discussion on open banking, but we will focus also on open finance, uh, which is gaining a lot of attraction um, in the union. 
Another driver we can, uh, we can refer to is to ensure that EU regulators and supervisors have oversight. Uh, now, I already mentioned during the AML discussion that we, the Europe is coming with a new anti-money laundering authority, but we see these across the board. Um, and I would also like to, to point out that the, the whole discussion about the role of technology, because it's raising a lot of questions around uh, if and how European regulator, uh, regulators should expand their supervisory authorities, uh, supervisory tasks to these uh, new technology players, uh, which is still an open question that we are trying to, to tackle. And finally, uh, and then of course, in line with the international developments as well, is to improve cross-border payments, again, would help achieve the, the, the single market in the union. And these would be done uh, primarily through the reduction of costs for transactions between the member states and to enhance uh, transparency uh, across all the players. So I hope that gave a, a little more context to where Europe is coming from. So having that in mind, I think the key question is what exactly are we expecting in the upcoming months in the, in the payment space? And we focused here on four, the four main files that are coming up, actually five, uh, although some are quite related to each other. The first one is the revision of the PSD2, which is the Payment Services Directive. So the legislative process for this file has already started. We have currently a targeted consultation ongoing, which will remain open until the 5th of July. Uh, after the consultation period is closed, the European Commission will assess the consultation responses and will decide whether or not uh, to come forward with a new proposal to open and to review the PSD2. So it's still not certain, but most likely uh, there will be a proposal revising the PSD2. Um, so as I mentioned, there is no proposal yet. We would expect these in the first half of 2023, and I would actually argue the first quarter of next year. Um, so we cannot say for certain, but there are three things that we would expect should the PST2 actually be revised through a new proposal. Uh, the first one is the reassessment of the strong customer authentication rules, uh, particularly to extend and to, to have possible new additional measures to the strong customer authentication process. The second one is a review of contactless limits. And in here, uh, in here, I would uh, mention the fact that this, of course, is deriving from as well the experience from the past two years with COVID. So we would expect the contactless limits to be increased uh, should, the, should the directive be, be reviewed. And finally, and also in line with what we've been referring so far throughout this presentation, um, is to revise uh, unre uh, services and entities that are currently unregulated under the PSD2. This includes cryptocurrencies, but also, but not only, you would also refer, we have here, for example, the outsources and outsourcing provisions. So a second action, an important one, uh, that we are expecting this one sooner. We would be expecting this in September this year already. In fact, I think we have the 21st of September for this proposal to, to come out. Uh, is a proposal to promote and to enhance the full uptake of instant payments. So the goal is to have this full uptake by the end of 2022. Uh, in here, we would not expect a completely new proposal. Uh, rather, it would be an amendment to the SEPA regulation. And this amendment would take mostly, uh, would be focused on two key areas that we have here on the slide. The first one is to mandate the adherence to the SEPA instant scheme. Uh, so. Well, in fact, essentially what it does is to make instant payments mandatory across the union. And uh, the second point would be to promote standard, uh, standardized QR codes, which so far have been mostly focused in terms of uh, the standard bodies in terms of development, but these would be then included in the proposal for instant payments uh, in September. <clears throat> One final point that we have included here, and this is more at the moment a discussion amongst uh, the EU legislators is whether or not it would be possible to have a European label or a European logo uh, that would identify eligible pan-European solutions for instant payments. And these would be, uh, we would expect this to take a little bit longer than the proposal itself, and it would be by the end of 20, 2023. Um, a third proposal that we are expecting is on a new framework for open finance. Uh, this, in fact, work has been conducted in parallel with the PSC2, 
and we would expect it in the, as well in the first half, potentially first quarter uh, of the next uh, of the next year. So, as I mentioned, it's being developed in parallel with the PSD two, meaning that there's also a, a targeted consultation at the moment on open finance. It will remain open as well until the fifth of July, and the process will be similar. So the Commission will assess the consultation responses. Uh, with the caveat that for open finance, we know that the proposal will uh, definitely be coming in the first uh, in the first half uh, of of next year. I will come back to with a little more detail on open finance through through a number of examples in the upcoming slide. So I will leave it at that uh, for for the moment. The the last two proposals that we are expecting and they are quite related to each other uh, is on the digital euro. So. Uh, as you know, the, the governing council of the European Central Bank has approved the, the initiation of the investigation phase for the digital euro uh, in summer last year. And this investigation phase started in October uh, last year for a period of two years. So it will be running until uh, October 2023. Now, so far, the work has been mostly an internal work of the ECB in terms of the design features, distribution models for the digital euro, feasibility studies, so on and so forward. However, for the digital euro, for the ECB to be actually allowed to issue this digital euro, we would need some kind of a legislative proposal provide, providing the legal grounds for the ECB to do so. And this proposal would have to come from the European Commission. And this is exactly what we are expecting uh, towards the end of this year. So the Commission has closed very recently in the mid-June uh, a consultation on the digital euro. So we would expect the, these to come uh, in the end of this year. Then we also made reference here to the Settlement Finality Directive also towards the end of this year. Uh, this is quite related to, to, to the proposal on the digital euro because it would be necessary uh, in terms of allowing access uh, to interbank systems should a digital euro actually uh, be issued by, by the European Central Bank. Um, <clears throat> I think in terms of proposals, um, this is what we, we are expecting down, uh, down the line. I think all of them is still relatively early to say what exactly will be the impacts if we don't actually have the text in front of us, but we would see the potential to increase, for example, uh, the burdens, uh, potentially the investments that are necessary for certain entities uh, I'm referring you, for example, in terms of the strong customer authentication in case this is uh, the, there is additional measures under strong customer authentication. This would involve uh, higher amounts of investment for certain entities. Uh, but as I mentioned, too early to say uh, until we have the actual the actual proposals. All right. So with this. Uh, now that we know the, the proposals, we know the objectives, we, what, what we would like to do, what I would like to do is to just provide a couple of examples to see how exactly uh, are these coming together, how is Europe tackling these. Uh, the first one, uh, I will not go into great detail into the slide, but uh, instead I think taking a broader perspective, looking at these, the idea is that Europe, as I mentioned, through its strategic autonomy, uh, for example, it's aiming at having this rollback on card-based payments vis-a-vis uh, -vis account based solutions. And what he's doing uh, is through diff using different roads to, to, to achieve this objective. And I think this is the intention of what we are trying to transmit with this slide. So uh, first, what we are seeing uh, is an enhancement of uh, leveraging of new uh, payment solutions. Importantly, that would be sponsored by the by the European Central Bank. Uh, so this is what we have here on the first column on the on the slides. Um, but then it's also doing that through, for example, um, actually providing these incentives for card based payments, and it does so, for example, through capping uh, interchange fees, which would ultimately incentivize the use of cards. Uh, and then lastly, it's pushing forward different proposals that I've mentioned too that ultimately promote the use of account-based solutions. And this would be on the PSD2, for example, the open finance that I've referred to, and also the instant payments, I believe I mentioned these, uh, would be potentially an account-based instant payment solution, and all of them would ultimately together uh, reach the objective of the union to ro roll back on card-based payments, which, well, in fact, are mostly non-European players at, at the moment. 
Um, the second example we put, I already men made some reference to these, but it's in terms of the European uh, oversight. So there is, as I mentioned, the AML framework with the new anti-money laundering authority, but we are seeing these across the board. We are seeing these potentially through the PSD2, the, the Payment Services Directive, where we could see the introduction of a use supervisory framework. Uh, we see these, I believe, Nick, uh, if time allows, we'll go a bit further into these, but we see these on DORA uh, in terms of an oversight for critical third parties. We are also seeing these uh, for the PISA framework, for example, and perhaps for, for some context, this PISA framework uh, follows the central bank's mandate to, to ensure the, the smooth functioning and the smooth operation of the EU payment system, and it does so by designating relevant, relevant payment schemes and arrangements for the centralized oversight by, by the ECB. Uh, and this was put forward in the, in the end of last year. Um, so we have all these schemes, uh, all these uh, different structures that ultimately centralized at the European level oversight and supervision and move it away from, from national member states. The, the final example uh, I would like to make reference to, because in fact, we've seen a lot of activity on these. Now I would like to take a moment to go into, into a bit more detail here, uh, is on the open finance uh, framework on the open finance scheme, which as I mentioned, we would be expecting in the beginning of, of next year. So a legislative, um, this, we are now expecting a legislative proposal, but in fact, this has been uh, mostly since the beginning an industry-led initiative, and it has been led through the SEPA Payment Account Access Scheme, uh, although with the caveat that it's also been through, not a sponsorship, but through a push of the European Central Bank, and the aim is to have in line with the drivers that we have identified in the beginning, to have these open payments in the EU throughout the, through a scheme-based approach, so basically, uh, the same uh, structure that we see through the SEPA schemes uh, at the moment. So there is a lot of discussions going on in the SEPA group, but um, we here highlighted the most uh, prominent ones, I, I believe, which first is to enable premium payment services in the EU. And the idea here would be to go beyond what we are seeing currently uh, in the text of the Payment Services Directive. Uh, and this can also, in a way, be seen as a way to move towards open finance beyond payments and perhaps more importantly, to move towards open data beyond finance. So to have this data sharing across sectors uh, in order to enhance um, payment, uh, payment products, uh, essentially. <clears throat> uh, for this reason, so to have this data sharing going on, uh, a big part of the discussions as I've also been focused in Europe in terms of harmonization, interoperability, uh, reachability, which are slightly more technical discussions, but are important to actually uh, be able to, to, to create this open finance, uh, that, uh, finance framework. So when discussing, uh, I think it would be my last point, when discussing access to data and requirements to, the, to make these data available, uh, and accessible, uh, of course, the question of who will bear uh, who will bear the costs comes to mind, and this is of course also being discussed um, at uh, at the group and at the EU level as well. So we we have a, a scheme here example, exemplifying uh, one of the remuneration models that could be considered. I will not go into detail into the scheme on because in fact it's a proposal, but. Uh, the idea would be that we would have asset holders, for example, who would make the, the information and the transactions available through the scheme. Um, and this would be through a fee. Uh, and of course, here important to mention also uh, with the consent of the asset, uh, asset owner. Um, yeah. Um, I think to close on the on the payments uh, on the payment space. Um, I would just like to mention the international dimension as well, um, and also to allow some time for, for questions. Uh, so I would close with international space. Um, so just a small comment, because I've, of course we've been focusing on the, on the discussions in the EU objectives, the EU, EU initiatives, but we cannot lose sight that a lot of what we see, uh, of course, with the caveat that it, it includes uh, the Euro Europe's uh, specificities, uh, given its complexity of uh, 37 member states, but we cannot forget that the actions are also aligned 
uh, with what we are seeing and uh, Europe builds on, on the developments also at the international level and in the payment space, uh, I would like to highlight the importance of the G, uh, G20 agenda and in particular the roadmap to, to enhance cross-border payments. Uh, this is a rather complex roadmap. Uh, it's built on 19 building blocks, uh, but they do departure from five pillar stones, uh, which we have here uh, on the slides. And uh, I believe a lot, of, much of these actually are reflected on the actions that we went through in terms of European actions. Uh, just to mention the five, uh, the five then pillar stones uh, of the roadmap would be the commitment of pr private and public sectors. And again, this relates, for example, European level is doing this through enhancing uh, information exchanges, for example, for different purposes. It would be the regulatory supervising and oversight frameworks. Uh, which, as uh, as we saw, Europe is uh, working on these as well. Then there's a on the same coin two sides, uh, which is on one hand building on the existing payment infrastructures and arrangements, and on the other hand uh, also creating new payment infrastructures and arrangements, leveraging and here the example of the digital euro. And finally, um, in terms of data and market pra uh, practices, which would be through harmonization, uh, as I was referring to in terms of interoperability, for example, reachability standards, uh, so on and so forward. So only to, to make this uh, small comment that that is European action, of course, but uh, we also align with uh, the international space. Thanks, Andrea. And I'm conscious of time, and I see there haven't been questions yet in the Q and A, but it'd be quite nice if, if there were some. I know we've kind of got quite a bit of substance and bombarding people. I I will keep this very short. The last two section, the last section, on operational resilience. I think here just to point out. Obviously, as we move more into the digital space, more questions arise about the integrity of systems, IT system, ICT systems the vulnerability to cyber attacks, not least because of the geopolitical situation at the moment. So um, it's interesting to note that Europe is taking a slightly different approach to some of the other jurisdictions, but all jurisdictions are going in the same direction in their objective. Europe is going down a very prescriptive approach. Because we have a single market and we have certain comparability within the single market, we are much more prescriptive. I think that is the key message of this slide. <clears throat> if we go beyond that uh, to Dora more specifically, I think the key point really to say is that there's now for the first time, and it will be formally agreed by ambassadors today, uh, a horizontal piece of legislation that applies to all financial services and minimum standards that apply to ICT security. It is also new because for the first time it creates an oversight framework, not direct supervision framework, but an oversight framework for critical ICT providers, notably cloud operators, uh, data aggregators like Bloomberg or IHS Market or Reuters, providers like that, and also other key infrastructure providers, ICT infrastructure providers in the financial services market. We've put this in for completeness, but we are, as I said, quite pleased because you're not subject in the credit union space to this legislation. In fact, credit unions are explicitly carved out, but they are subject to national regimes. And for, for colleagues from Ireland, Poland, and some of the other jurisdictions in Europe, often the national regimes can be tougher than the European regime. So this is not a get out of free, uh, out of jail free card, but it's important to recognize that credit unions don't fall under the integrated European framework. If we go through it very briefly, I don't want to go into it, but it gives you the headings at the top. It requires a mandatory ICT risk management framework, a clear ICT incident management framework. So how do you report? What do you report? How do you deal if you had a breach? It goes further uh, on the digital operational resilience space on the next, exactly. Um, <clears throat> So you have to regular test your systems. The bigger you are as a financial institution, the more intense these tests become. You also have to manage your third party risks. So this is the flip side of what I've just described. It's the financial institution having to decide how to engage in the outsourcing arrangements with ICT providers. And then 
Finally, as I said, there's an oversight framework for critical third party providers and the obligations that they have. They fall ultimately over on an oversight framework directly at the European level. So this is, I think, important to the extent, and this is worth maybe exploring also globally, to the extent that credit unions might in the future use cloud uh, service providers, for example, then you might get caught indirectly in this framework and how you engage with cloud operators. And we know the US Treasury is working on a high level working group, has established a high level working group to look at these issues uh, at a global level rather than seeing fragmentation. But it's important to recognize that certain ICT providers that you might or might not be using fall under this framework. Finally, and very briefly, on artificial intelligence, just that you're aware of this, um, really the key thing at the European level is that uh, AI applications are ranked by the level of risk. And really it's, it's important to realize this kind of just a framework. It ultimately means that a certain, so the level of risk is measured by the impact on individuals, on in disclosure of individuals, choice around individuals, if it in any way seemed to be discriminating on race, religion, or other elements, then basically it's either banned or has to be put under significant uh, oversight frameworks. You also, in addition, have to develop a bit like what we had on DORA, a whole range of operational requirements, which is set out in the next slide. And which obviously we can share with you, but it's kind of the type of requirements that you have to have in place whenever you apply, irrespective of the level of risk, AI applications. So you have to have risk management frameworks in place. You need to understand why you're using it. You need to understand its implications. You need to be able to switch it off. You need to ensure that it's robust. So these are general governance frameworks. And then on the last slide, or one but last slide, we move to the high risk frameworks. <clears throat> so this is important. And the reason why we put AI into this, because Andy made a really good point. The AI Act is likely to be the GDPR Mark II. So to be like the aspiration of the Europeans is that this framework would be exported beyond Europe into the international framework on how to deal with AI. And one of the high risk applications that is deemed to be subject to higher rules and obligations is credit worthiness assessments. So anything to do with consumer credit, mortgage credit, where AI applications are being used because they you know, ultimately look at patterns and income will be seen as high risk. And what does high risk mean? And that brings me to the final slide. It effectively uh, imposes an additional level and layer of compliance obligations. So we've just now set out some of the general principles that apply whenever an AI application is used. But if it is a high risk one, then further additional requirements uh, come into place around the quality of management, the oversight. So it's basically an additional layer. And importantly, it is an ex, you have to have an ex ante uh, conformity assessment carried out. You can't, so in advance of using the AI, not uh, wait until it's kind of being enforced. So you have to go through a certain compliance exercise in advance. With that, Craig and Andy, I know we spent a lot of time. I apologize. Uh, I hope it was useful. And obviously, we'd be happy to take any questions. Nick, thank you. I, uh, that's fantastic. I, I have two questions, a not so serious question, but a second more um, more serious. My, my first question is one, how, how do I get rich off of cryptocurrency? But uh, <laughs> that's my not so serious question. My, my real question though, is though, it, there, there's so much transformation going with payments, the requirements for instant payments, open banking. My question, the disruption to a traditional financial institution that mobilizes deposits, where, where do you see the biggest risk for that model getting upended or what, because a lot of these things keep me up at night, frankly. Um, what, are, what are some of your thoughts? How, how does the traditional bank or credit union make it through all of these changes that are coming down? 
Yeah, I, I, I think fair enough. I, uh, that's a very valid question in the context of credit unions because we were just very factual in describing what's happening. On the crypto assets, I think my, my best recommendation would be to buy a time machine <laughs> and go back when, when Bitcoin was just launched. Uh, and then go back into the future with it, a bit like you know, <laughs> like the film. Uh, beyond that, uh, I I don't know. I think uh, just a point on crypto assets. <clears throat> uh, the way I justify and explain it is at the moment it's used as a speculative tool, a bit like tulips in the 17th century. But I think some of them will have a use case in the context of some of those digital transformations and the way of smart contracts are used in the way certain applications apply. So I think between you and me, I think there's a lot of speculation into the future use of these technologies rather than in the inherent non-existent value right here, right now. But um, anyway, let, let, let's see. I think there's a, in the future an interesting use case. <clears throat> I think coming to your point, I think you're right. What technology does is ultimately disintermediate it brings in, you know, the, the value chain is, is being fragmented. Uh, the customer relationship at the moment technically moves more and more to some technology providers at the front end. And it, it, it will create a lot of tension, I think, a commercial tension in the market the, uh, it, through this, this intermediation. I'm not necessarily saying that's a good thing or a bad thing. <clears throat> I think it will put a strain on credit unions, particularly smaller ones. Um, from a European perspective, it's currently seen as positive because don't forget, we're trying to create a single market across 27 member states and technology can, for the first time, overcome some of these boundaries in a way that regulatory initiatives or other things couldn't. So you see much more cross-border activity by retail investors. And what this technology is supposed to do is to help people switch. But, but the flip side is it's not quite clear what happens to cost, uh, consumer protection. It's not quite clear how we make sure the compliance framework is in place. And it does kind of discount, I think, unfairly the, the uniqueness of the relationship between the banker or financial institution on the one hand and the individual or, or let's say the history of, of the customers on the other. And I don't think we have a clear answer to that yet. Um, I think that's all we can say at the moment. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the technology, I mean, my argument has always been the technology focuses on the, the how we do it, but the who does it is, is equally an important question and particularly for credit unions that are member owned not-for-profit financial institutions who are often serving underserved areas, that, that issue is, is precisely what we're arguing at the G20 level that they need to, to, to focus on as well, because if they really are serious about using technology to solve financial inclusion, that's the way to do it. I, I'm gonna turn it back to yes, Greg, but I think we're running short on time, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, indeed we are, Andy. Thanks so much. And Nicholas and Andrea, thank you so much as well. Um, I want to just put out a note. If you like this event, you want others to see it, you can refer them to the World Council YouTube channel at youtube.com slash woku. That's youtube.com slash woku. It's going to be available there later today. And just an FYI, if you like what you heard from our guests from Afore Consulting today, Luca Giusti from Afore will be participating at a breakout session on developing global digital solutions for credit unions. That's gonna be at our 2022 World Credit Union Conference. You can still register for WCUC, which will begin July 17th. It's going to be held in person, July 17th to the 20th in Glasgow, Scotland. We'd love to see you there. You can register by visiting wcuc.org. That's gonna do it for today. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Have a great day.